Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we answer your questions from swimming sauropods to the blue whale to that episode of Friends. And also, where Dave went wrong. Hello, and we've come to that time again. It is episode eight, which um, we've we've basically started a tradition after... After one series. Yeah. This is the time when you, our wonderful listeners, and our magnificent juicy patrons get to ask us questions. And I was uh, very impressed by Javaraptor, not only for having the name Javaraptor, I think his real name's something like G. Hancock. Yeah, Java Raptor, they sent in a question. Well, not as a question, it was a comment under under a thing. And it, I love this comment because it proved that Dave was wrong. That's not a big challenge, let's be honest. <laughs> it's about crocodiles' eyes, Dave, isn't it? Yeah, so I've spoken well, more than once because I think we did this right back at the start with Chris Packham in, in episode one, series one. Um, the idea that dinosaurs were tetrachromatic, that is, they have four different light sensitive cell types in their eyes which that has extraordinary color vision and into uv um and it's been pointed out in this comment that that may not be true of crocodiles so it's definitely true of lizards and snakes and it's true of birds and the inference therefore is it's true of dinosaurs um i said that it's true of crocodiles as well and the thing is that may not be true we don't actually know for sure uh, but the suggestion is that actually crocodiles are trichromatic, so they have lost one of those. Now, normally that would change your inference and you'd go, OK, so if crocodiles are the ancestors or the nearest thing to the ancestors of dinosaurs are tri and birds are four, then which one are dinosaurs? But given that crocodiles are the outlier when all the other reptiles and indeed a bunch of amphibians and fish um, have multiple different um, receptors then it looks like crocodiles are kind of the oddity. And we do suspect, you know, modern crocodiles are very active in low light. They're crepuscular. They are indeed crepuscular. So that's the kind of thing that would lead you to sacrifice some colour vision for better fine detail and light gathering in low light. So it doesn't change what I said about dinosaurs probably being tetrachromatic, but it, there is a subtlety about how certain we are about quite how well crocodiles can see into UV and other ranges of colour. So if you are trying to like outrun a dinosaur, not outrun, but trying to escape um, a, a Tyrannosaurus rex or something, because if they aren't trichromatic, if they have got more colour receptors, that means they've got less... No, because they've got these massive eyes, so they've got loads of Because, detail, right, so they? then you've got... Right, yeah. so that's the thing. You've got the trade-off between eye size and cell type. But then I've suggested in my book that T-Rex may have been nocturnal or borderline nocturnal, in which case wow. maybe it, ha- it had sacrificed some of its colour vision. But as you say, with the giant eyeball, you may not need to. Yeah, it's trade-offs, but... If you're wearing very jazzy clothing, you're better off impressing a snake than you are a crocodile. So that's good. So now another one that a correction you've got to make is about uh, trianosaur teeth, isn't it? Yeah. So that so this is something I spotted the other day actually uh, rereading some papers. So I've definitely talked about tooth growth and tooth cycling and the fact that dinosaurs their teeth fall out and then they grow new ones. Which is why we find so many of their teeth. Which is, which is part of the reason. And I've definitely said that Tyrannosaurs cycle them every couple of months or so. Uh, apparently that may not be true. And oh. there was a paper a couple of years ago, which I completely missed, suggesting that for big Tyrannosaurs, it was something like 700 odd days. In other words, nearly two years. Oh, wow. Now that still means, obviously, they, you know, a T-Rex has something like 60 teeth in the mouth and they might get to 12, 15 years old. That's still a bunch of cycles, and therefore you're still talking about hundreds and hundreds of teeth for one animal. But it's quite a long way out from my suggestion that this was happening every two or three months, which would obviously make that number much, much higher. So again, again, kind of, I think there's a theme for a lot of the corrections that we've had, and we do have less corrections this year, is that the general point was correct, even if the very specific details I wasn't entirely accurate. And of course, he meant fewer corrections. <laughs> I can hang up. There we go. <laughs> okay, now it just says on the notes, because, you know, Dave's nice. He sent me a couple of notes that say, well, you know, these are the corrections we need to mention. And that's about the universe ending. Yeah, so this is a comment from uh, Geraint Lewis, um, who pointed out that I was somewhat frivolously, because I'm not really sure that I'm... <laughs> 
<laughs> was was ever intending to be accurate. I made some joke about we well, have to wait till the heat death of the universe, and that's a trillion years away. Um, apparently, I was out by a few orders of magnitude, and the heat death of the universe won't happen for about a hundred trillion years. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so we've got we've got a way to go. <laughs> there we go. But all our atoms pulled apart to the point where they no longer interact. There's, yeah. there's depression for you. <laughs> Never dream of immortality for that reason. He did send us a lovely uh, message, did Garrett. So I, I thought maybe we could answer a few of his questions because we've got yes. we've got quite a few here. So this was um, Phil Plate's episode about you know the extinction events, the um, big rocks, big rocks, exactly. So. He asks, if the rock had been a few hours later, it would have missed the Earth. What, what's the thought on how dinosaur evolution would have continued if they'd not been wiped out? So what, what would dinosaurs look like today if they'd carried on without, you know, mammals getting in the way? Yeah, I mean, first question, of course, is, or the first answer is who knows? Um, because evolution well, takes all to. kinds of... You're the dinosaur expert. <laughs> Well, as a, again, <laughs> apart from the mistakes, you you really don't know what else may have happened. Um, you know, we'd still have gone through warming or a cooling or continents moving and all invasives and diseases and this, that, the other. I will say that there is a huge history of speculative evolution. Um, so people speculate about these kinds of things and try and use sound evolutionary principles and known, almost if you like, biological tropes. Um, of, you know, big, you know, if you look at big carnivorous dinosaurs, for example, there is a bit of a trope of getting a big head and reducing your arms. So tyrannosaurs, big head, small arms, abelisaurs, your favourite big head, small arms. Yeah. You know, is that going to exaggerate? Is that going to turn up in other groups? And so there's there's been loads and loads of, well, there's loads and loads of websites now these days, but there's been books on this kind of subject for years. The most obvious one, one by um, a guy called Dougal Dixon. Dougal did Good a night. series of this, um, He's done loads of dinosaur books. Many people will have heard of Dougal or will have had his books without necessarily realising. Um, but he did a, a kind of a, a trilogy and he did After Man. So that was a, it called a zoology of the future, which I had as a kid and loved. Um, so all these things like giant terrestrial bats because they lived on islands that bats got to the islands before birds and then evolved to become terrestrial and they run around with their front legs because obviously they're flying and then their back legs are little kind of grabby legs. Oh, that's weird. And so so cool, cool things like this. So he, he did that. Then he did one called The Future Dinosaurs, which is exactly what this question is about and included things like, yeah, a super large-headed, no-armed tyrannosaur. And then he did another one, which I, I believe only ever turned up in Japan because no one in the UK bought it, called Man After Man, as if humans diversified into lots of weird species after the collapse of civilization. I could talk about this forever and it'd still be all kind of meaningless and I'd feel bad because it's not an area I know very well, but I know there's a t- ton of stuff on it so i'd say go out and look for this because you you can find lots of speculative evolution stuff on dinosaurs uh which will have ta- tackled this more seriously than i can in two minutes for a question but there are there are more extinction events than just that one rock hitting the planet though. oh absolutely i mean there, there were two just in the dinosaurs because the, there's one actually at the end of the triassic which was a fairly ma- it counts as a mass extinction though it's arguably the least mass extinction of the mass <laughs> extinctions uh, seriously enough to be a mass extinction not serious as, as the others um but that's you know the the fact that the dinosaurs survived that and a lot of other reptiles that lived alongside them got wiped out is a large part of why the dinosaurs diversified and took over so the dinosaurs themselves went through two mass extinction events and plenty more in between extinction in general is normal you know new species and new lineages arise and others go extinct mass extinctions where something fairly serious happens you know or, or bigger extinction events i should say which you know, affect a big continent or a big area, you know, are very common. And then mass extinctions, okay, they're, we, they're a few and far between, but they are very serious. Again, they're all, ha- they are all common. They all turn up repeatedly. And the key words that follow them are climate change or precede them rather. <laughs> yeah, but basically um, all caused, there might be different causes, but the net effect of what's actually killing things is usually climate change, which, yeah, isn't at all relevant now. 
Yeah. Said slightly worryingly. Now, um, Shayla Howell has written in, and she wants to know, right, could sauropods swim? So they're the ones, for those listening who goes, which ones are sauropods? They're the ones a bit like, a brontosaurus and diplodocus and all the cool slow moving we think with all big with body tails. long neck long tail exactly yeah. henry hoovers could they swim could they swim? yeah almost certainly so as a, as i think we said when we talked with um esther on swimming like but basically everything can swim in the sense that if it's in water and floats it can thrash around a bit and probably move in the direction it intends I doubt sauropods were good swimmers, but then you'd look at an elephant and think they're not very good in water, and actually they they are decent swimmers, so you, we might be surprised. Um, they also mentioned, mentioned in the question this thing, the, the tipsy punters, um, which I think we talked about, but I didn't call it that. So this is work done by um, a paleontologist in Canada called Don Henderson, who does these lovely 3D, very complex 3D models of animals and then like digitally floats them to see what they do <laughs> and show you that really some <laughs> sauropods, they, 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 they kind of float front down. Oh. And so and so tipsy punters was something that he coined just being kind of slightly silly. And the idea being that if the water was about the right depth, their back legs would come off the ground, but their front legs wouldn't as they floated. And the idea is that they could probably walk across the bottom oh my God. just using their front legs, just using their hands. And so this was a kind of punting because obviously great big long legs on these animals. And so he was kind of making a you know, deliberately silly analogy almost of a gondola or something like that, of this big long pole reaching down, touching the bottom and using that to move them along. Um, That's genius. And the, the question was kind of, like, has this been resolved? Um, which implies some controversy, controversy that could go either way. But I, I don't think anyone has any serious problems with Don's work. And there are these alleged swimming trackways, and I think we talked about these, that show various animals going in, footprints getting shallower and coming back again. And there are at least, if I remember correctly, because I've not reread Don's paper recently, there are a couple of sauropod trackways that show this. Um, and so I, I think everyone's pretty convinced that for the right species, at least, if the water depth is just right, yeah, their, their bum will start floating. Oh, and they wow. can paddle along a bit and then come back down again. Their long neck would come in so useful for that as well. Because if their top so heavy, they can still breathe through their long nose that can be just poking out the water. Yeah, I mean, you, you, this, this is an animal that's fundamentally at the surface. We're not mm. talking about a submerged animal, but it's that... It's it's that point of balance because we we talked about this uh, as as well on the locomotion effort the difference between your center of mass uh, and with your lungs that makes things and then with sauropods with all their air sacs it makes things very complicated and there's also a center of buoyancy and the point is that when you float your center of mass will end up below your center of buoyancy and that can obviously on land that's not a problem but when you're free floating that will end up potentially tipping you into an awkward posture mm. and that's basically what this would do but yeah the head and neck will still be well clear of the water oh but in really deep where you're trying to reach with your toes maybe and okay fair enough we'll move on eric Ferringer is asking it's always said that a blue whale is the largest animal to ever live now in terms of mass he understands that since it's aquatic and doesn't have to deal with gravity pulling it down but having said that in terms of being the largest and the longest surely some of the titanosaurs are way bigger oh is he wrong for thinking that and why is it always said that the blue whale is the biggest animal to have ever lived so the reason people say that is really in biology when we're talking about biggest uh what we mean is mass or weight because that relates to biological function. And almost every part of your biology will end up directly relating to your mass sooner or later. It's also true, it's, this is also perfectly true of boxing. Just so. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's weight class. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, though, yeah, I'm not sure what categories blue whales fall into. I mean, there's super heavyweight and ultra weight, and then we start getting... My, my point being that you don't, you don't categorise boxers by height. So you could have a very small stocky one against a very long thin one. Yeah, and but it, it's that kind of thing. So, you know, energy consumption, metabolism, water balance, locomotory speed... 
uh, development time, all the all of these things ultimately relate to how much you weigh and not what your linear dimensions are. I mean, they can obviously manipulate things a bit, particularly when it comes to things like surface area, but mass is the one. When we, when we talk about size of animals, what we really mean is weight. Um, and the other reason we do that is if, if you really want to go for length, there are worms that are longer than blue whales. There's a thing called the bootlace worm, and they get up to absolutely ludicrous lengths. I'm I'm gonna do, off the do top they of my head. Live so... Inside you, are they the ones? That no, live in... no. Oh, cool. I, I I think I don't think they're parasites. I think I think they 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 live in mud and stuff. But there there are there are organisms that are longer than a blue whale. So if you just want the maximum length. It's not a dinosaur, and it's not a whale, it's a worm. Um, even if you do want length, yes, you could probably get sauropods that are longer than blue whales because of, you know, extraordinary tail lengths that we see in that group. I think we call this one the flagelli cordata, which is diplodocus and its nearest relatives, and it literally means whip tails, and they have these stupidly long tail extensions. Some of the bigger species of that, so things called seismosaurus, which is now probably just a different species of Diplodocus. But anyway, the tail might be 25, 30 metres long, even though an awful lot of that is basically just these tiny rods of bone. But then that's kind of the point is that, well, if you just stretch animals out, you're not really making them bigger. You're just cheating to get get more of it. So, yeah, you might be able to find a couple of dinosaurs that are longer than a blue whale, but you definitely won't find one that's heavier. And weight is what we're really interested in. And blue whales, it's like he sa- um, Eric said, they can be that heavy because they're in water and supported by water the entire time. Yeah, it is it is more complicated than that. So bone actually is extremely strong when when loaded. So there's this idea that when, if you tried to make a dinosaur of 100 tonnes, like, the you know, the bones would start to splinter under their own weight. They actually wouldn't because bone is incredibly strong in compressive loading, in other words, taking weight like that. And if you're that big and move very slowly, then you've probably got three legs on the ground the whole time. And actually, a big sauropod you know, bone can take probably 100 tonnes in loading, certainly split between three legs, because then you're talking about 30 tonnes in loading, and then that's not that much. <laughs> Speak for yourself, mate. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a bit more complicated than that. You, you probably run into bigger, probably a bigger problem is can you get enough food in? And we've talked about the potential for like this hyper-efficiency of really big sauropods um, being able to like super digest and break down cellulose and things that normally big herbivores can't break down, which gives you more energy. But that's still going to be less energy than a blue whale that can cruise up to krill and eat a couple of tons of living protein in one mouthful. That's going to get you a bit further. So whereas a sauropod, even with a big head, can only eat so much and get so much energy out of it. Weight is going to be a factor because, yeah, as you get bigger and heavier on land, it definitely does cause issues. But it's probably not the big thing which a lot of people think it is and like the sole reason you can't get bigger animals on land the only way you're going to do it is if you get a massive dinosaur that only eats something like bats and hangs around a cave where it can sort of inhale right and then and then you run into other problems because of course normally um animals that you could eat they themselves eat plants and so they're far less common and so they're well distributed you you get this phenomenon in the sea that you just don't get on land where under the right conditions phytoplankton can just grow and grow and grow and duplicate extremely quickly and then the uh, zooplankton can feed on that and it can spawn super quickly and so you can get these absolute colossal localized spots of huge amounts of you know living matter that's animal rather than plant catching it is easy you just yawn and catching it is relatively easy yeah and you just don't get that on land so we've got another question for you this is from uh, gutza one i don't know what gutza one's mother was thinking but um <laughs> how plausible is it that there could have been a lineage of non-avian dinosaurs that survived on antarctica but went extinct due to the complete glaciation of Antarctica 14 million years ago. So the, they linked to a deviant art, which is very, very cool. Um, now, uh, Gutza knows that the that Antarctica had proper winters, even in the Mesozoic, so the life there would have been adapted to dealing with months of cold without sunlight. And apparently the asteroid impact occurred in June, which is when winter starts in the Southern Hemisphere, meaning that any life living in Antarctica would have already prepared for winter and might have had a greater chance to survive 
Can I can I have a stab at this one? Yeah. And that is um the 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 fallout from a massive asteroid lasts more than a few months. That lasts years on end. So the the sun being essentially blocked for photosynthesis <laughs> and production of food lasts for a long time and therefore anywhere on the planet is going to be massively affected by that for a decade probably and surviving it is going to be really hard unless you can move yeah i mean that's that's all true i mean i guess the the potential counter argument to that is well you know clearly there were pockets everywhere where things survived otherwise we wouldn't have birds and mammals and frogs and things like this now so just how likely is it? And I, I think it, it's just that. It's like there's always a chance of something. I think we said in the, in the, in the extinction episode, you know, I'm very happy, and I think most paleontologists are very happy with the idea that some dinosaur somewhere survived the KT extinction. But if those are little localized pockets somewhere random on Earth, then even if they survive for 10 million years, we need to find that spot. <laughs> then preserving fossils that are then accessible to us now. And that's extraordinarily unlikely. And if it, if they've survived up to 40 million years ago, so that's 50 million years, you'd find there'd be a lot more evidence potential to find them. They, they should have been around. They should have divert. They probably diversified. If they're that adapted to cold environments, you know, they could... A switch to swimming or something um but it's not like it, we've done many digs in antarctica is it well we've done a few but then of course not much that's much more recent you know the people have been going after cretaceous stuff actually we, we have pulled dinosaurs and pterosaurs and other things from antarctica but yeah i don't know if people are digging around in the stuff that is say 20 30 million years old uh, yeah. really not my area but yeah it's how plausible is it not very because it was a mass extinction event which killed just about everything everywhere is it possible yeah i guess so but with all things once you've got a small lineage in a small area you know every million years makes it that much less likely that it's going to survive because you just need one disaster and it's and it's gone it's really weird to me to think that there were dinosaurs living in a place which was dark for five to six months of the year yeah i know imagine dinosaurs in the dark oh Oh, that's scary. Right. <laughs> now, Joe um, McLaughlin has written in to ask a very, very important question. Now, this is the second time, so we need to answer this question. Very important dinosaur question here. In the TV series Friends, season three, episode 14, the one with Phoebe's ex-partner, Ross and Rachel are arguing about a boring lecture he took her to, and he says... That one bone proved that that dinosaur had wings but didn't fly. What dinosaur is he talking about? It's very important. What one bone was it? It's very important. No idea. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably why we didn't answer it last time. Well, so first of all, I don't know when that series aired. I mean, Friends was knocking around in the late 90s, yeah. I want to say. And series three would be relatively early. So this so, is before but- most of the feathered stuff had really come out and when it was only just starting i'm assuming that they're rel- we're thinking of something like deinonychus or velociraptor and even we've already talked about it in the birds episode the the, the semi-lunate carpal of deinonychus would be about the kind of thing i'd guess they're talking about because obviously deinonychus was too big and too heavy to fly mm. but it had the right wrist folding to allow the hand to fold in the manner that a wing does which allows the thrust cycle of flight so given that I really, really doubt the writers of Friends sat down and worked this out by reading the scientific literature or asking a paleontologist, I'm going to guess that they saw something in National Geographic or half remembered from some documentary. And that's probably what they're thinking of. It's the wrist bone, Joe, obviously. That, that's my guess. Now, Java Raptor, as well as giving you an amazing correction about crocodile's eyes, uh, this G. Hancock, what is Dave's opinion? Opinion on the functionality of the second toe clause of Dionychosaurs. So we've literally just been talking about Dionychus and Velociraptor. And the disparity between the Dromaeosaurids and the, oh my goodness, Truodontids, pedial morphology. So let's talk toes. Sexy, sexy dino toes. So the the PDs are, are basically the, the, the feet. So pedal morphology is in the toe morphology. The second claw is the, is the that's the one from Jurassic Park you yeah. know the big hooked one that taps on the ground and are nasty nasty um and dinonychosaurs 
are is is a term for that groups together dromaeosaurs and troodontids. We've talked about both. Dromaeosaurs are the group that most people are listening are probably familiar with and crop up more often because it's Deinonychus and Velociraptor and Microraptor and a lot of these other common, fairly famous animals. The Truodontids are very close relatives, which look very similar. We've di- we've talked about Truodon being nocturnal, right? Or the possibility of it being nocturnal I with its so. owl ears and giant eyes. We have mentioned owl ears before. Right. This is this is because it's got it's got one ear up and one ear down. That's the one. Yep. Yeah. And some Truodontids, I think we also talked about this in the food episode. So some Truodontids have really weird serrated teeth. And for a long time, there were arguments about whether they were actually herbivorous or carnivorous or even omnivorous. But in terms of their kind of gross body plan... Don't be, so, don't be body shaming. Their gross body plan. <laughs> I'm not saying it's... <laughs> <laughs> their overall okay, body fine. plan. <laughs> yes. In, in, in terms of... Well, to, you, to use, the, to use the, the correct bow plan, which is oh. derived from the German, but just be kind of body shape. Bow plan. Yeah, it gets used quite a lot. Um, I like bow plan. It's a really cool word to use. Um, mm. But yeah, in terms of the bow plan, they're, they're really, really similar. And the, then that, of course, becomes really interesting because if, if troodontids were herbivorous, why the hell do they look so similar to the carnivores? Surely they've changed what they're doing in the shape. Um, I don't think there's massive differences between the two in terms of their pedal morphology i mean they both still have a big sharp you know an enlarged raptorial claw which can be retracted to a certain degree the other problem is the way that a lot of claw morphology is dependent on the sheath and not the underlying bone i've Mm -hmm. I've actually written a couple of papers on this and it's a real pain and i've been trying for years to work on a bigger paper talking about this exact problem Um, so we know that The shape of the bone underneath gives you a hint, but not a great picture of the shape of the living claw. And so you can potentially be quite misled by thinking that one has a bigger claw than the other, or a sharper claw or more curvature on its claw than the other from just the underlying bone. I'm guessing there probably isn't that much of a difference bone-wise looking at a dog's and a cat's claw, really looking at the difference there. And the difference is huge, especially if you've got one on your lap and it decides to claw in. Yeah, well, and people also forget that blunt claws are quite sharp. I mean, you can be scratched quite badly by your dog, even though it's got fundamentally blunt claws and doesn't have the retraction that allows the cats to retain the, you know, that super sharpness. I would say that there's not that much difference between them. I mean, certainly comparing them to almost any other dinosaur, they're far more similar to each other than anything else. So even if there are a lot of differences between them, they're going to be pretty subtle in the grand scheme of things. So yeah, I, I would say I don't think there are particularly big differences between them. And therefore, given the variation and the plasticity that's out there, the uncertainty in those reconstructions, it's going to be hard to say very much meaningful about it. So this is yet another we don't really know. I'm not sure it says much. And if it does, it might be quite misleading. Are there any, just um, an easy question, are there any massive, like really unusual animals alive today with really weird claws that we don't think about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, not not so much today. I'd say that the, some of the fairly recent ones, so giant sloths, for example. Of course, yeah, um, they're worth having a look at. So they have these bizarre, like hooded claws, and we're not going off on Penelope pit stop. Um, I'm trying to think how best to describe this. If you imagine like a tunnel, like a classic tunnel going into a hillside, so um, you know, an archway, mm. and like that as a sheath that comes out so a little kind of not quite semicircle because it's taller down the sides so almost out. like our own fingernails went sort of all the way almost down to the base but not quite to our fingerprint yeah so like that so that so they have this this arched shape and then from the middle not touching the sides from the middle then the claw extends out from underneath it it all kind of joins up at the back so this giant archway with a prong sticking out of the middle i don't think Wait. anyone knows what's going on so is that. is the prong attached to the top Where's no it's it? attached at the back okay so it's, so almost it's got like, like two written... claws at the same time yeah kind of uh, yeah weird. and then quite a few things so armadillos i know have this and i think pangolins do their claws are split so if you look at them, it's like a pair of points together. So if you put your palms together, because they're actually quite... But keep your fingertips separate, okay, they look yeah. like that. 
So there's big, there's a great big groove up the middle, but it, it like top to bottom. It, it's you think they'd be hollow. catching them on their pockets all the time? Yes, yes, you would. Well, but it, but it's an oddity because on the one hand, these are things which are digging into very hard substances, and so you'd think, oh, well, you want a really big solid claw to take the weight up, not turn it into two thinner claws. So on the one hand, that would kind of increase the surface area, but you'd think it would also make it weaker. So it's a really odd thing. I actually had a, uh, an undergrad who looked at this last year with um, myself and Jack Ashby, who we mentioned when we did wombats, because Jack is an expert on wombats. Square poo. He's an expert on square poo. Indeed. And he's up at Cambridge, who has a lovely giant sloth skeleton and so on and so forth. Um, and she was looking at various digging adaptations, and we were trying to look at these like hooded claws and these split claws and they do seem to correlate with digging they only ever seem to turn up in digging species okay. and those that might do certain kinds of digging because there's there's a huge difference to trying trying to like shovel sand aside like a mole and dig into things like termite mounds which are you need a chisel to do um but still there's really no clear pattern and i'd never seen anything in the literature on this jack never had and my student didn't find anything uh, hello jazz if you're listening yeah so as far as we know like no one's ever worked on this there is a massive gap in the beauty industry for nail extensions for all of these creatures so let's oh, let's yeah. move on um now andrew white came up with a brilliant uh brilliant question i think so because i know nothing about bird brains even though i've been called a bird brain on many um occasions so bird brains have roughly twice the neural density of mammalian brains that's amazing. So when they call me a bird brain, I should be happy, shouldn't I? That's, that's a good thing. So has there been any work exploring the implications of this for the non-avian dinosaurs? So all of these tiny brain dinosaurs, are they actually really clever? Yeah, so that goes back to, to a degree, what we're talking about with the, with the croc vision stuff and how you can make inferences on, on things like this. And this, this is an example of where it is very hard. Um, crocodiles don't have anything like that that we know of, nor do any of the lizards whatsoever. Basically, all birds do have this. They have, they really cram their brain cells in, basically, and they have far more brain per volume than you would expect compared to, I think, pretty much any other vertebrate. Because I know that, like, birds are clever, because, like, crows are meant to be really clever, but that, that's, why are we so, why, because, I mean, this is the one thing, that, I'm sorry, just, 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 this is the one thing about the human species that have really limited us is that we have got this limit to the size of our brain. We have to have our babies stupidly early because we can't fit the brains out through the pelvis bone. And birds have got it sussed because they've got twice the density that we do. Yep, because evolution doesn't necessarily solve the problem you want it to the way you want it to. Oh, that's just annoying. They're just smug. But that's the exact problem that we have is absolutely no evidence for this in crocodiles and lizards and any of the ancestors of dinosaurs present in all of the birds. So when did it evolve? And there is no particularly obvious reason to say it only evolved right when birds were already flying and it's a bird only thing and not a single dinosaur had this. Or to say after the crocodiles branched off, it evolved really, really early on and was inherited by the pterosaurs and all dinosaurs and all all dinosaurs had this phenomenon and therefore had twice as much brain as we think they do. There's no particular reason to pick between those two, so we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, oh. And, and, and it's one of those ones also where I don't think we really can know because I don't think there's any particular reason that this would leave any kind of signature on the brain case or, or in the skull. Um, I can imagine if you had particularly dense nerve cells in the brain that you might need a better blood supply. So you might expect to see bigger blood vessels for a given brain volume compared to something that doesn't. But I don't think we get, you can actually trace the holes of the blood vessels that you'd want to trace. Um, so I don't think that's going to show anything. I think if it would, people would have spotted that by now. And they could also just have weirdly like denser blood for red blood cells or something to make up for it that we just don't know about. Maybe you're looking at me like that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, it's it's it, that's one of those ones where so I, I reviewed a paper that kind of ran into this the other day, and they were kind of they had an idea and then said, well, it could work if you did this and if you did this and yeah, if you yeah. did this and if you did this and if you did this, and we're like. Well, yeah, maybe they did evolve all five of those things. But given that we've got no evidence for any of those five things, it's not much of a discussion to be had. I mean, you could you could argue almost anything at that point. 
but yeah, I, um, I mean, I really don't work on neurology and brains. In fact, dinosaur brain case is one of the things that... We can tell. I desperately try <laughs> and avoid. Thank you, Izzy. Um, <laughs> and so it's really not my area, but I know people who've looked a lot at this stuff. I am sure if there was a way of trying to work out what those correlates might be or what you could tell from the size of the nerve openings or size of the blood vessel openings in the brain cases, people would have been all over this like a rash. I guess the one thing you could say is flying is complicated and probably takes quite a bit of brain power moving around in three dimensions and controlling what you're doing. And you don't want to be too heavy whilst doing that. Based on that, you could make a reasonable case that the kind of evolutionary pressures which might lead to the origin of this phenomenon is flight. And therefore, it's not going to turn up in the vast majority of dinosaurs. Spatial Maybe awareness. it was around in truodontids and dromaeosaurs and things like that, which were gliding. And therefore, they are moving in three dimensions and maybe had some complex spatial patterning. Maybe they were moving around in trees a lot and they had to remember where certain food sources were. And that's another complication that's often required and might generate some more brain complexity. But I think the vast majority of dinosaurs are not going to fall into that category. I don't know. I mean, like hoverflies do a really good job of spatial awareness. They've got tiny, tiny brains. Well, true. But they're, <laughs> but they're also not very smart and are not capable of lots of other complicated behaviours as well. I mean, they make superb helicopter pilots. Uh, but let's let's move on. Right. I don't know, because you've got to do two different hands doing two different things and your feet at the same time. Oh, I suppose. I mean, maybe... maybe well, they've got four wings. Anyway, um, let us... You're looking very... You're looking counting wings in your head now, aren't you? Yeah, well, because they... They're, uh, hoverflies are dipterans, so they're, uh, so they're true flies. So they technically have four wings, but they're only flying with two of those. Okay. The other the others are just for... They're not, they're not dragonflies. They've got four wings. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so they... So insects primitively have four wings. Mm. Things like dragonflies fly with four wings. What many things have done is convert one set. So beetles, their wing covers are an oh, old wings, set of wings. Yeah. Praying mantis do something similar. Um, Bread mantis just like to freak people out. That's what yeah. they do. Um, <laughs> and then with flies, what they've done is the first little set of wings are converted to things called uh, whole tears or whole tears. And don't know quite how you say it. And they're tiny little wings. If you ever see a dead fly up close, you can see they have a. You can see it's the same kind of thing. There's a little pair of them. They sprung off of the same thing, and they're made of the same like membranous stuff with a few little veins on it. But they're tiny little things that sit at the front, and they're basically little. Um, they're basically little flight sensors. Okay. Um, so they do have four wings, but they're flying. The, what's actually doing the power and control is only a pair of them. It's like we've got four legs, but we only use two of them for walking. Yes. There you go. But, I which said are, something which is, vaguely Which is ironically right. not our four legs. Moving on, let us go to Ashling, Spain, right? Who's got this uh, interesting, like this big broad question with a big broad bush. Well, which th I think... Yeah, there's two or three and they all kind of interrelate. <laughs> I know. So what we'll do is we'll touch on this. If we need to go away and do an entire episode on this, just let me know. But how do we differentiate one species from another, especially when we only have fossils to go on? We've alluded to this already, mentioning how different species can hybridise. But she wants to know how this practically works with dinosaurs. The reason I ask the question is that it leads me to something else I've often wondered, which is how do we decide that one species has evolved from another? I think that last one might be a, an episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, yeah, I, I teach entire lecture courses on... <laughs> taxonomic practice um, for final year undergraduates and with no disrespect to our audience that's not the kind of thing I suspect I'm going to be able to compress down into a few minutes fair enough however let's have a let's have a crack can I, can I, can I just say from the outside perspective who's done like no zoology formally um, what I imagine it is is a load of scientists in a room with a colour chart trying to work out where blue starts and purple stops or where yellow starts and orange stops so that's the analogy I give my students whilst trying to explain this to them. Boom. So lots and lots of bonus points for Izzy. So taxonomy and species implies certain kinds of discrete units. This is, this is Diplodocus carnegii and this is Diplodocus longus. And that implies that there are two entities. But of course, it doesn't really work like that. Evolution, almost the definition of evolution, is change over time. It's easy for us to look at the world population of humans now and go, this is humans or, or anything. Uh, let's, let's pick boa constrictor. I like boa constrictor because it's one of the few things where its common name is the same as its scientific name. Nice. 
Um, so boa constrictor, they live 20 odd years. There is no boa constrictor alive today that was alive 50 years ago and none that was alive 50 years ago that was 100 years ago and 150 and 200 and 500 and so on. So boa constrictors now are at some level probably different to boa constrictors a thousand years ago because diseases change all the time and their genes have probably changed to a tiny degree, even if it's just adjusting to the local temperature or local humidity or whatever diseases are floating or around. Or what other boa constrictors find attractive. Oh, do it? Yeah, all, all that kind of stuff. And if we go back far enough, we'll get to a point where if we had a time machine and we went and grabbed one of those others and brought it forward, we'd look at the two and go, you know what? There's probably two different things here. The thing is, so that's the reality of what has happened to boa constrictors. The practicality is if, if I go and find a fossil that's 50,000 years old or 100,000 years old or 2 million years old and dig it up, I would look at it and go, it's very similar to boa constrictor, but it's not quite the same. I'm going to call it boa longus. I'm going to give it a new name because I think it's different. But it is going to be fundamentally impossible for me to say, was there just a continuous population and boa longus turned into boa constrictor? Or did it branch into two different species and boa longus went extinct and boa constrictor carried on? Or was there a third species that produced both of those? Or did boa longus turn into something else which turned into boa constrictor and we haven't found the middle one? We don't know any of those things. All we can say reliably is that these two look really similar, <laughs> but they're different enough that they're probably worth giving different species names to. And then all you need is another one and you can go, ooh, that one's different to this one, but similar to that one, but different to that one. And then you do the one of these things is not like the other song. And right. uh, draw a species around them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so that's where, you know, so you have got a continuum, your colour wheel analogy, and we are trying to draw lines. And with fossils, it's actually relatively easy. Because if you imagine, we're not seeing a big continuous piece of time or population. What we're actually seeing is the dots. You know, we, we've got a sheet of paper over that. And when we find a fossil, we can punch a hole in it. And therefore, it's relatively easy to go, well, that one's blue and that one's green and that one's purple. And even if we find a few more, we might go, well, that one's kind of purpley blue and that one's kind of bluey purple. But it's still closer to the blue one and that one's closer to the purple one. And so we're happy to call that three species. Because you can't see the difference in between. Them. Because we don't have them. we don't have all the intermediates. We don't we don't have anything like a population. We don't have thousands of individuals from one place at one time. Even if we did have that for dinosaurs, we don't have the ones from a thousand years before and a thousand years after, let alone ten or a hundred or whatever. And then we don't have all of the data like what colour they were, and we don't have what data like what their skin looked like, and if they eating a different thing even though their teeth hadn't changed or if they yeah preferred mating or they preferred living at higher altitude none of this will show up so most of the time we're more or less going how similar do they look to each other and if they are sufficiently different i.e we can pull out a number of anatomical features reliably which we think will separate them we'll call it a different species and if there's lots of them we'll call it a different genus um but it is always going to be somewhat subjective um, what I would say is that the way that lines up with living species, um, yes, there, there's always problems and there's always complications. It is a complicated subject. But uh, for a lot of the time, it actually like all the different ways of categorizing things actually line up. If you go out into your garden or look out of the window for anyone who's got lots of small birds around, we'll, we'll talk about British birds. If it's going to be the same wherever you are. Um, you know, we've got things like blue tits and great tits and coal tits. And if you look at them, it's like, well, okay, blue tits are the ones with little blue head on their head. Great tits are a bit bigger with black. Coal tits are more like blue tit size, but black and different pattern. Long tail tits have a long tail. There are simple, clear, physical, external differences that we can pick up on. If we broke them down and look at their skeleton, you'd actually also see a bunch of differences in their skeleton that we could tell apart. If you measure things like their song and measured their behavior, you would be able to tell them apart. If you looked at their genes and their genetics, you'd be able to tell them apart. But they'd still give you the same fundamental clusters of blue tit, great tit, cold tit, long tail tit, and then whatever else you wanted to look at. So it and doesn't... pretty much all like peanuts, so... True. But it, it means it doesn't really matter if you're looking at the genes or looking at their physical traits or looking at their behaviour. You will still probably come to the same conclusions of what those species are. And in fact, it might be almost better in some respects because we are so um, visually drawn to modern animals. It's very easy to mistake, you know, 
the male and female of some species for a different species altogether. Yeah, and, and that's where we have made mistakes in the past, for example, with bats. Bats are a great example of this because we are very visual and would tend to look at the physical attributes of bats. And bats don't care about that because they're nocturnal and mostly communicating with sound. And what they're more interested in is what other bats sound like. And there's a bunch of bats which everyone thought were basically one species until you start looking at their acoustics and you realise that they literally can't hear each other and therefore wow. are not breeding with each other because they're obviously their ears are attuned to the noises that they're making. And if they're calling at a frequency that another bat can't hear they are very unlikely to find it and mate with it. So they can look almost identical, but they're definitely not mating and, and, and sorting themselves into separate species, and their genes reflect that. But I'd love to talk about, like, a whole episode about all of this and actually the detail of diagnosing dinosaurs. Oh, and then, sorry, in terms of the last bit about, like, how do we tell one species evolved into other? Yeah. Normally that never, ever, ever, ever happens. Mm. It has been argued for Triceratops because we're in a rare position where... In Montana, you've got this thing called Hell Creek, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of Triceratops specimens in a big hillside. I mean, it's, I, mm. I don't mean one literal hillside. I mean, in an area where we've got the stratigraphy and you can dig them out at layer after layer after layer after layer. And if you do that, you do see the two different species that we've named of Triceratops. It's very clear at the top and at the bottom, but as you move through the layer it starts looking less like A and more like B. And oh, that rather cool. suggests that you have got one turning into the other. That still doesn't mean that that's definitely what we're actually seeing. Um, because who knows, they may have branched off to different things. Um, it may be a third population, which happens to look like them. There might be hybridization going on. They might be things migrating in and out. But there is at least the possibility. Um, I think it's I think it's pretty strong and the evidence is pretty good. But that's like the one good case that we've got. And even that's not certain. That's, I mean, that's what you do definitely know is that it's a lovely place for a Triceratops to live. Yeah. Because if they're around for that length of time, they must love it. Yeah. So finally, Richard Bald, he wants to know, do we know anything about how social dinosaurs are? I mean, do they hang around at parties? Do they exchange phone numbers? No. But honestly, I mean... I, they're I, the ones in the kitchen who are just... <laughs> yeah. I mean, is there, there's no anatomical way of deciding if an animal is social, is there? No, that would be very useful. So, so we're entirely reliant on footprints, mass mortality sites, um, and stuff like that. Um, so I have a massive interest in social dinosaurs. I've literally just written a book chapter for a popular science book, which should be out sometime next year. And I, I wrote the chapter on like dinosaur sociality Ooh. and group behavior. Um, so boy, can I talk about this? And I've written a bunch of papers on this subject. I think we're going to have another entire episode on this, aren't we, at some point? Oh, it, it, I think it's been on the list since the start, when we, when we first sketched out things we might do. But I frankly didn't want to be too self-serving and just talk about my research for the first couple of series. I felt I should probably do T-Rex first. But the, the, the very short thing I will say is, on the one hand, I think the case for sociality in dinosaurs has been repeatedly and grossly overstated again and again and again in the scientific literature. I think people have taken extremely vague and circumstantial evidence often of which is very uncertain and tentative and used it to make big blanket statements that you can't possibly make off that evidence and so there's lots of stuff like this group was pack hunting this group was social this group reared their young together mm. i think it's completely unsupported not everything but a huge amount of that is completely unsupported on the opposite side of that, I am absolutely convinced that large numbers of dinosaurs were doing just these kinds of things. Now, those sound contradictory, but I hope it's clear that they're not. I think that what we know from the behaviour and intelligence of birds and crocodiles show that these behaviours are well within the behavioural realm of dinosaurs. And when it comes to things like living in groups, there is so many individual cases where we found large sets of footprints together or large mass mortality sites. It's very unlikely that all of them are a result of a chance accumulation or migration or a drought forcing things together, etc. Etc. Et but going from 
lot of dinosaurs were likely living in groups to this group were living in groups. This species mm. or this clade were living in groups. And to even then go on and advocate for something like sociality, which I think is a kind of another level of interactions and relationships, I think has been very poorly handled in the literature to date. See, what I'd like to find is, and it'd have to be two things, I'd have to have the proof of it modern times of the species of bird or creature that has a particular type of like accoutrement to it, it's like a type of feather or, or something which can only be cleaned with the help of another creature. Yeah. And then that would almost prove that if this creature was either surviving, it either had a really useful like coparasite or it had to have another animal helping it. Or even, you know, maybe just a juvenile that was utterly useless, like, you know, unless it was <laughs> unless it was looked after for like ten years or something. That that would be my my short version. So I, mm. I think a lot of dinosaurs were gregarious, that is living and or spending large parts of their lives in groups. I'm sure some of them were social. So you have, you know, dominance and hierarchies and all kinds of interactions and, you know, even friends. Like even chickens. If you look at chickens, they're very, there's huge hierarchies going on in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. birds and that sort of thing. So I know yeah. we don't think, we think of wolves and that sort of thing, but all sorts of animals have the hierarchy. Oh, oh yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. And and they're friends. They're, there are individuals that they're more likely to hang around with and they're more likely to help who are more likely to help them and, and things like this. We, we absolutely... Chicken friends. Yeah, we absolutely know that lots of animals are doing this. But as I say, I think the, the case is often massively overstated in, in, in dinosaurs. It's that living with dinosaur things where we try to make it too much like um, walking with dinosaurs, not living with dinosaurs. That'd be terrifying. Where we try to make it so much like a modern day documentary that uh, it was a bit taking too many liberties. I, I think people just want them to be this and they want this evidence. Um, you know, they want evidence to be more convincing than it than it can be. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I think it needs a, not necessarily a kind of fundamental rethink, but we need to really look seriously at what, what data that we've, we've actually got. Um, and in particular, what living animals do and, and how you can how you can use that. So what, one that I often I love throwing out. So wildebeest, you know, we look at the massive wildebeest migration that we see every single documentary ever. It's right. Here's a million wildebeest going across the Massamara and the Serengeti because everyone loves that. Um, and that's really seasonal because they're, they're chasing the rain because they're chasing the food. In South Africa, they don't do that mm. um, because it just doesn't, the, the seasonality isn't there in the same way with the monsoon. So they just live in the same place most of the year. Uh, and, when, and when they do move around, actually the females move around and the males stay, stay where they were because the males have staked out a territory and they want to sit there and keep that territory and wait for the females to come back. And they will starve to keep it. Right. But if you look at what that would do in the fossil record, what you would find is repeatedly you would find loads and loads and loads of wildebeest together because they're all crossing the river and they're all drowning and you're finding them in large groups. And it would be very easy to look at that and go, look, wildebeest live in large groups. And of course, A, they don't because that's the Maasai Mara and they're doing that because they actually aggregate to migrate. Uh, So actually, most of the time, they're hopping around in little groups rather than one big group and secondly that's not what a large part of the species is doing Mm. so you've misrepresented it twice you've taken an annual event and assumed that it's normal and missed the fact that that's only happening in that pocket and nowhere else and i think the same thing is happening you know we go and dig up a mass mortality site and go look here's 50 hadrosaurs in a big hole in the ground that died in a river they lived in a family group in a big group of 50 and it's like well why do we think that why is that 50 of them living together and crossing the river and all drowned? And why is that not a thousand of them who normally live in groups of five all tried to cross that river when the river was really high and that's why 50 of them drowned and normally they'd have nothing to do with each other and the answer is often uh, we don't know time machine needed yeah but as i say you we found loads of groups together and they can't all be from that no but then well how do you know which one's which you don't. And as I say, it, even if they are, that doesn't tell you about all the others. Well, as you can tell, mainly because of the wonderful support of you guys and our patrons, do check out our Patreon, um, we're going to do another series. This is what we've decided to do. We haven't decided exactly when, because I've got a book to write. 
<laughs> yeah, dear, I've got book e- I've got book edits to do, and I have never been busier in terms of teaching with the last <laughs> exactly. six months, basically. So our plan is we're going to release um, a few extended interviews and um, on our Patreon. We're also going to release on our normal feed some of the stuff that we've been given to Patreon previously. So you know you won't be without us at some point around Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. Um, I hope to um, uh, be putting out a little video. We will do some um, extra uh, questions videos, but we're probably not going to restart this until January. So um, next year, probably. But we will be about, and you will um, hear episodes. Please look at the Patreon page, look at our um, Facebook page and look at Oh, well, our Twitter and I think you can get in touch with us. But um, thank you so much for your support because it really, I mean, we were surprised, weren't we, Dave? Yeah, yeah. We've got far more patrons than we thought we were going to get. Which is really great. So it it really has motivated me to really try and put out really good stuff for you guys. So I hope that you like it and we will be announcing stuff. So you'll be first to know if you're on Patreon. If you're not on Patreon, you will know anyway because we will badge you about it. And aside from that, do we have anything else we need to say? Um, well, I wanted to say for any who has been listening now we've got through two whole series if you have enjoyed this we hope you have because you're still listening at the end of the second (laughs) series if you could take literally two minutes we'll obviously put the link up somewhere but obviously depending on what format people are on they won't necessarily see the the show notes yeah if you go to if you go to my um website so davehome.co.uk you'll see uh, outreach and a little drop down that says survey. I'm running a survey and this is part of my job and I have to demonstrate that the outreach events that I'm doing are reaching people and making a real difference. And that's incredibly hard to do because you can say, I had 10,000 people listen to my podcast and they'll go, did any of them care? And it's really hard to prove that they did. And the one way to find out is to ask them. And so, yeah, there's a little two minute survey of click the button just to say what you've done and what you've enjoyed and and how you enjoyed it. It would be extremely useful if people could do that. And I've I've been very good and waited to the end of the second series and I didn't push this on you on every episode. So please do it. (laughs) Also, um, if you want to support my endeavours, I've got uh, my book, The Unstoppable Letty Peg. If you know any sort of, you know, short people or even adults who like reading children's fiction, I know who you are, Harry Potter fans. Um, It's uh, Bloomsbury. It's called The Unstoppable Letty Peg. It's about a little girl, a bit violent. It's also out on audiobook, so you can go to Audible and download that too. But yeah, do have a look at that. Or we'll just go to isedi.com and just, you know, like things. I don't know. I don't know really. Yeah, I mean, honestly, guys, you've been you've been more than we've been expecting. You're really sweet. And um, thank you so much for supporting us. Uh, and we will be back as soon as we can. As soon as we can. He's nodding at me. Yes. Oh, dear, he's hurt his neck. And, and now, and now, yeah, yeah, now, now rub it. I've got a sore muscle in my neck. Good. I've nodded too enthusiastically. This makes a great radio. But we hope we hope <laughs> to do some more like YouTube livey type things as well. So we, we won't be gone too long, we hope, and we will be back as soon as we can. And until then... Rawr, rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. For bonus episodes and extra content, please visit our Patreon page. You can also purchase a mug, t-shirt or a Terrible Lizard face mask from Redbubble. Go to terriblelizards.co.uk for links. Send us your questions. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. Include the hashtag terriblelizards. We hope to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So please like, share, leave a review and subscribe. <laughs>